Okay. I'm Chloe Lum, and I'm one of the event programmers at Volume Montreal. And this is our first uh, Zoom artist talk for this edition. Uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge that Volume Montreal is based on unceded Indigenous lands. The Gane Gahage Nation are recognized as the traditional custodians of the lands that we operate from. Shoshoge, Montreal is historically recognized as the gathering place of many First Nations. Today, it is the home of a diverse group of Indigenous people and settlers. So I assume that people who are here for this talk are somewhat familiar with Walter's work, but I will give a short introduction. Uh, nevertheless, Walter Scott is born in 1985, and he's an interdisciplinary artist working across comics, drawing, video performance, and sculpture. His graphic novel series, Wendy, chronicles the continuing misadventures of a young artist in a satirical version of the contemporary art world. Wendy has been featured in Canadian art, Art in America, and published online on The New Yorker. Recent solo exhibitions include The Scrawled Heel of the Real at Ashley, Berlin, and The Pathos of Mandy at ISCP New York. His new graphic novel, Wendy, Master of Art, is now available from Drawn and Quarterly. After Walter's talk, he will be joined in conversation with his colleague and friend, multidisciplinary artist and community organizer, Lenore Claire Harem. After which we will open up to a few questions from our audience. Um, take it away, Walter. Okay. Um, <clears throat> hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, thank you, Chloe. Thank you, Volume, for Montreal. And I have a little uh, PowerPoint uh, presentation that I'm going to pull up and use it just to talk through very casually, like a little bit of a run through over like where Wendy began and also like uh, my art practice just sort of in general. Wendy began in 2011, I'll say. It was exactly 2011. And I like to show this slide as the first slide because um, it's indicative of like the mood of the first Wendy zine that I ever made. And uh, it's the location is, is very, very close to the place where I made my first Wendy drawing, which was a really crude drawing of Wendy hungover and um, vomiting. <laughs> I drew it on a placemat in a restaurant called Miracle Pizza uh, in St. Henry, and Divided Brunch was inspired by that place. Um, and so much like Wendy is hanging out here with her artist pal, I too, uh, came of age in Montreal and hung out with my artist's friends at the diner. Um, Wendy's humble beginnings were in zine form in 2011. I compiled a whole bunch. Well, somebody, like, uh, I was posting Wendy on Facebook, just like little one-pagers, and somebody wrote a comment saying if... if um, if I made a whole book that they would buy it. And I, I said to myself, well, then maybe I should. So I put together this um, book, about 60 pages. Uh, and as you could tell, because I screen grabbed this from my Tumblr, uh, I began by selling it in an Etsy store um, and, and splurging to get it stapled, uh, paying a little bit extra to get it stapled uh, at the coffee shop was like a big choice for me at the time. So just to indicate how much of a humble beginning it came from. So here we have another panel from Wendy, uh, indicative of the kind of space and the kind of life I was living at the time. Um, as you can see, like it was a lot cruder back in the day and more about gags. Um, and like obviously the storytelling has gotten a little bit more complex, but I definitely do feel like I try to maintain this like raw sort of quality of Wendy or hope that like the DNA or the spirit of that will always will always be there. 
So then in 2014, Annie Koyama from Koyama Press, she got a hold of one of my zines because I had released two at that point. And she said, if you make a third uh, worth of content of zine and we put it together, we could put it together in three and then like sell it as a book. Um, so that's exactly what we did. Um, so that's how Wendy officially got an ISBN number. She, uh, Wendy has, uh, you know, been published in many different ways. And the reason why I show this slide is uh, just to show how, like, um, there was a Japanese edition Wendy book that was written in English and then translated into Japanese, and it wasn't published in English for a long time. And then we did, like, a little tote bag with it. Um, I kind of liked the idea of Wendy being this, like, cultural figure that is like also kind of murchy or can translate into all of these different modes of dissemination. I like to show this panel because uh, this is from a back page uh, feature in Modern Painters magazine, maybe in like 20, yeah, like 2014. And um, what I did in the very last panel is I um, snuck Wendy in an image of the book into the comic as a way to like promote the, the, the comic in a legit art magazine as a way to not have to pay for advertising but have like um, advertising for it anyway. Um, as something that I consider like a little bit conceptual about like the ways that we silo like cultural production and, and like how to like uh, infiltrate like systems of dissemination and use them to your own means. Um, so yeah, this is an example. I, I'm really actually quite shocked that they let that happen and it didn't get really get flagged by anybody, which I guess has to do with the editors being really cool. Um, so, so there's Wendy, but there's also this whole other part of my art practice that was kind of emerging at the same time as Wendy. Like around 2012, 2013, I, um, like, the reason why I made Wendy to begin with was because I felt like I was, I was um, post-art school a little bit lost about, like, what I wanted to communicate and how I wanted to do it. And I made, like, a bunch of work that I consider to be kind of boring now. Um, but then, like, and so then I decided to make Wendy as a way to not participate in the art world or just make things on my own terms without thinking about what they mean like not creating work um that's like made for an institution and figure out how it fits in um so ironically like making wendy and like thinking through narrative like i had a studio i moved to vancouver at one point and i had a studio visit with a curator that said like if wendy uh wendy is you sort of using narrative to to create something and like you don't have to be um, afraid of using narrative or fiction or jumping out of fiction to make other works or other kinds of work and I think for you know that was kind of like a like a keystone for me at a certain point is that like things can stem from fiction or from story for me and and so that that's kind of where these sculptures emerged um, is that I thought about them in relation to not a particular narrative, but like narrative in general, that like they could spring from some unknown or known only to me sort of like story about their making. Um, and also have a self-referentiality in, in the way that Wendy is self-referential and a satire of the world that it's in. I thought materially it might be interesting at the same time or maybe this was even subconscious to like create work that is aware of its own materiality. And for me, I, I, I imagine that like, for instance, the sculpture might pick up this thing and like knock itself in the head and like destroy itself that like it has like an, a, a material self-awareness. Um, and another sort of element that I think is tied into this idea of narrative or fiction um, is human hair. I was using a lot of human hair at the time. And 
the way that Wendy sort of functions as an avatar of myself, I thought that like hair and the the suggestion of like a wig uh, indicates something about like an alter ego or a costume or a drag or some sort of like performative quality that the works might have where they're also sort of indicating something about having an avatar or an alter ego. Uh, and in that way, sort of having a personality. So yeah, speaking of hair, um, and speaking of infiltration or speaking about um, presentation, I adapted this, I adapted a, a page from one of my books and um, I turned it into this very specific uh, six panel sort of poem that is about transformation and about um, fiction, um, the fiction of the self while dyeing one's hair from from blonde to black so it is like about transformation through like narrative of the self and um, I presented it on the side of Mercer Union in Toronto and having it be public facing but have it be about these interior processes uh, having it be about what people do in apartments in their personal lives it was this link between like what might be happening in the neighborhood and people's lives and and like a sort of, a more sort of like public persona um you know and it's a neighborhood that was like changing a lot and um there's a lot that you could bring into it by having it the context be public similarly um this was also taken from one of the books and this is a little bit more of a recent one. Um, how are we doing for time? What time is it? One second. Yeah, so this, this is presented at the Art Gallery of Hamilton. Um, it was maybe about three years ago now. And it's part of a, I was a part of a, a Canadian comics exhibition at the Art Gallery of Hamilton. And so I had this up really, really large because I was thinking about this, like, um, this thing where a lot of Toronto artists that I knew at the time were moving to Hamilton as a way to find a way to have a life that wasn't as expensive as Toronto. And it's somehow, like, similar to this, thing about like Canadians like there's I also feel on this other end there's these other people I know where this is like this pressure if you're a Canadian or from Toronto to move to New York and that like for some artists like not being able to move to New York is some kind of failure or something like we're always sort of like comparing our reality with some other better greener grass American reality um, and so I thought it might be funny to have this artist say that like the reason why they're not moving is because they're actually doing it for benevolent reasons but only for now uh so yeah like the thing about like this piece being in hamilton is that like it's a place where like torontonians might further um like divert their ideas of like themselves as successful artists um, for now. And then here's a Japanese Wendy sign. Pretty self-explanatory, but if anyone has any questions about it later, I'll talk about it then. Um, and so, thinking about sculpture and thinking about Wendy, like, one thing that I encountered going to grad school in Guelph in 2016 is um, a lot of the faculty were a little bit sort of like, how does your sculpture and how do your comics relate? And, and sometimes um, it felt a little bit like one needed to justify the other or like if it didn't make sense. I'm sorry. I just wanted to see who's watching me. <laughs> Uh, 
Yeah, so if if like it's like people wanted the sculpture to somehow relate to the comics in a way that was very one to one. And uh I guess this is kind of like an example of how it felt to be in grad school. Um like why are you making objects and then I was told that like when the faculty said they actually feel like they're like looking around the sculptures to like look at the drawings because the drawings are more interesting and so in this comic I made it that like the garbage is more interesting <laughs> um, so yeah I, I think it's something that kind of like messed with me a little bit and I, uh, although I went into grad school to focus exclusively on object making, I found that it became infused with this sudden desire to understand how it played in relation to like my comic work. Um, and like, in that sense, it was almost like I created this sort of rat king of like amalgamation of comics and sculpture together. The result of it being this kind of work uh, in about 2018, I would say. Um, this is presented at Macaulay Fine Art in Vancouver. It was a solo exhibition of sculpture. Um, a lot of this was made right, right either when grad school was ending, when I still had my studio there, or during, or a little bit after. Like, it all came together very, very quickly, um, and I. I had a hard time talking about it. I had a hard time understanding why I was making it. I had a show of this work at uh, the Reme Modern in Saskatoon that very same year, which I fully admit to myself, like kind of didn't feel completely resolved. And it got like a couple of pretty like thoughtful, but also lukewarm reviews. And people were saying, you know, like, again, this thing, like, Walter's comics seem to be saying a lot, and then compared to those comics, these sculptures don't seem to be saying much at all. I'm not quite sure if that's true or not, um, but I knew that regardless of whether it's true or not, I had, like, also fallen into that neurotic trap a little, where the sculptures on their own were there to communicate something, and it's a language that I, I guess I had convinced myself that I hadn't really figured out, uh, especially in relation to this like comic thing that other, that people seem to have been responding to. Um, so I basically said, okay, well, if the sculptors aren't saying much, like how do I get them to say something? And very simply, I used the language of comics um, and gave them word bubbles and literally made these collages where they started to speak and they were speaking about both their anxieties as, as sculptures but also maybe my anxiety as an artist and but the joy of it is that it opened up an entirely new door to the way that I think about um, making objects or the role of an object in an art practice, like in a more holistic sense. And I was able to use these photographs uh, as collage material and integrate all of the different kinds of languages that I was using already without thinking too much about the, um, the categories of each of them or the, um, the way that we're supposed to absorb any of these in whatever context. And in a way, it was um, a way to even think about flattening or expanding reality or perception, like formally. Like here, they're thinking about, they're talking about something in a space that is also in the space, but maybe not, and thinking about something in a space similar, but smaller. I mean, I don't know. Um, yeah, so I think that there was like, a psychological dimension that was able to be like sussed out a little more by by operating in this way and and in that way like autobiography started to leak into it as well so then you have like a portrait of me coming out of another dimension getting entangled in these arms that are separating the sculpture through like another door 
Um, and I, yeah, I had a lot of fun making these, and it was like more fun than I had had in a while. Because I think like with an art practice, it kind of goes like this. Uh, in terms of like something feeling fresh and then not fresh again and then fresh and then not fresh again. But I will say I think that it it gave me the confidence to actually embrace uh, the use of like language uh, and illustration in sculpture, but on my own terms, where I felt like before it was external and I felt like it was a solution that like I had to come up with because other people were asking, where I was able to just sort of uh, decide how that works best for me on my own without pushing too hard. And so that's kind of where this kind of sculpture emerged, where it literally is sculptural work that is in a metaphorical and literal sense, suspended by words and suspended by language. Um, and there's also something there about like the both hiding and the revealing simultaneously of an artist that's, that's working in an autobiographical way. Here's another angle of it. Um, and like my interest in figuration, you know, is still prominent and still there. Um, this is like, if you put this together, it's kind of just one body, uh, split into two. And for this specifically, if we're thinking about language, the blue parts are metal. They're like this letter, a bunch of letters that have been welded together and painted blue and then the the black lines are representative of the like act of making a black line on paper like i have this interest in the idea of a drawn figure where the lines just collapse and they're actually just made out of one line and i draped it over these letters because um one thing that i always say about this work and i think in general is that like when you're trying to make sense of an experience it's often like uh, trying to superimpose one type of language onto another, and it doesn't always necessarily get to the, the truth of a situation, especially like a somatic or embodied situation. So to have like one type of language literally draped and incomprehensible over another uh, was a way for me to try to, to make that point formally. And the collages continued, bigger and more um, kind of psychedelic because this is like during COVID where there wasn't much to do except sit at home and, and draw. Um, and in that way, it froze. Okay. In that way, um, this interiority began to emerge and I was sort of just allowing myself to throw everything at the wall. Um, And yeah, kind of using these kinds of drawings as a laboratory for the things that I was thinking about. And some of these things kind of like became um, ideas for sculptures later. And again, like there is like a lot in this about like visibility and shame and uh, the persona of the artist and the act of looking the anxieties of the art fair. Thinking about, uh, I'll speak briefly about this. So this, um, I was also, I guess, thinking about the anxieties of institutions. Like, like this work is not so dissimilar than, than this in a way. This is just existing in the real world where I was thinking about how we consider um, art spaces like this place, the Plug-in Institute of Contemporary Art in Winnipeg, to be these spaces of expanding or like expanding our awareness of things or expanding our perception or expanding our curiosity. Uh, so I literally like had these hands sort of like prying open the pre-existing architecture to reference how we have this sort of like complicated relationship to institutions where these things happen. And th this um, building specifically is uh, called the Bueller Center. And it says it like at the very top of the building in, in, in a red font, the Bueller Center. So I had the nail polish be color matched to the color of the sign so that there is this uneasy uh, sort of like 
there's an uneasy implication in the institution that we still are a part of, regardless of how we try to shape it or get away from it or destroy it or burn it down or rebuild it. Like, there is, you know, that relationship that can be sometimes difficult. Um, so yeah, speaking of narrative, I, after doing like an array of different kinds of um, artworks in different mediums and combining them and taking them apart and putting them back together, I decided to lean back into something that, you know, was one of the first things I used to do when I wanted to be an artist, which was animation. And I thought like, I'm, I'm, I'm so wrapped up in narrative that why don't I just make animated films? So I made an animated film called The Pathos of Mandy. Um, if you're in Toronto, it's currently at the X space, uh, X university space um, on, in, um, on Richmond Street. And it's another example of, of me trying to collapse reality, these realities together. Um, this is the bed that I was when I did I made this in New York and this is where I was subletting in New York so this is literally the bed that I would sleep on and I superimposed these characters into these places that I was like actually living at living in at the time um, it froze again but this other image where Mandy is lying on the studio floor is the floor of my studio as well that there and these are literally like my notes so yeah I guess you could say it's autobiographical um, we'll talk for a couple more minutes uh, this is from 2015 and it's a documentation of a science fiction script that I used to perform called Zendi's Revenge and here I'm performing it with my friend Jillian Tamaki at the Buddies and Bad Times Festival in Toronto in about 20... 17 maybe and quite simply I just had a bunch of drawings that I w would put in a keynote much like the one that we're looking at now and and um, I would put them uh, in a carousel like slide after slide after slide and just show them one at a time a bit like a moving storybook and this uh, Zendi's Revenge is kind of like the space version of Zendi. So it's like, take out the W and replace it with an X. And then it's Zendi and she's a space pirate. And the whole thing was like, really like Kathy Acker inspired, like inspired by Kathy Acker's writing, like Pussy King of the Pirates and just that sort of like freeform sort of thing. Um, experimental writing that she does. It was a way to take like the conventions of Wendy and like warp them a little bit and set it somewhere else and like free up the kinds of prose that I could make. And so, yeah, these performances were like pretty fun and I was able to fold in more ideas about like art theory or cultural criticism uh, in ways that were freer because, you know, it's set on like things like Kombucha Planet and like the curator is like turns into a gallerist and like, there's a whole bunch of these weird fantastical elements. I um, ended up turning one of the characters from that sci-fi script, Zenona, into her own thing that was called Zenona. It was uh, for the NFB and it was a um, multimedia, it's an online multimedia animated essay that you could find uh, through the NFB if you Google it. and so this, I'm, I'm mentioning this as an example that like taking one thing and like kind of stretching it and like turning it into other things is kind of what's going on, especially with the sci-fi script. Um, because I performed this script on Zoom like last year, no, this year, very, very early this year for a, co a colloquium that was put on by the Yale School of um, Race, Indigeneity, and Transnational Migration. And I hadn't revisited the script in a long time, but I was asked to perform it, and there was a lot of feedback about, like, people were interested in it, and, and I was like, huh, I guess there's like some, still some life left in, in, this, in this script. 
And so I had to look at it again very recently, and I was like, well, I could adapt this again, you know, into, say, a film or something. Um, I had to, like, update a lot of, like, the art theory, and I had to, like, revisit the way that I think about certain things. And I turned it more into, like, a soap opera and, like, a story about, like, human relationships. And that's basically what I'm working on now. So what you see here is um, what's taken over like most of my life now, which is like these puppets. So I'm going to be, I'm, I'm in the process of making this uh, semi-animated um, sci-fi queer puppet soap opera drama. Um, and technically and formally something that I'm interested in is that I, they're not going to be moving. They're not going to be animated. They're going to be static and I'm going to film them and maybe there'll be a little bit of movement, but it's in the post-production where I'm going to animate like eyes and mouths moving. So um, because I still like formally, I'm interested in the idea of bringing life to an object rather than making an object come to life. And that like there's like some sort of like chasm where the like reality of the object is still there, but the life is sort of like implied sort of around it. Um, also, it was a great excuse to just glue glue shit together um, during the pandemic when there wasn't much else to do. Um, the fact also I'm interested in formally is is that you could see things from the real world in in the in the movie that give a sense of scale, but also indicate something about like that it's just just outside, but referencing a world that we know and exist in right now. There's another image of a planet. Um, I made a jacket out of a glove from the Dollarama. And I do a bit of Googling here and there to be like, okay, what does like a cockpit look like? What does this look like? But I'm relying heavily on my own subconscious sort of science fiction tropes that are already there just to see like, in a free associative way, like what comes out and what kind of forms are made, like just from doing it like that. Uh, so there is like, what's turning out to be a bit of like a drag queen thing <laughs> happening with this one, which was kind of an accident. Um, and then here's sort of like the Grimes pop star character. Um, but uh, something that I really enjoy about this process of puppet making is um, much in the way earlier I talked about how narrative gave me the confidence or I found my way through creating objects again after a period of having no confidence. Something about making puppets and having there be an endpoint and a use to them really frees up the anxieties that I have around the association of materials together. So it, it becomes less of a psychological like conceptual mindfuck to glue hair uh, and model magic together next to like a found object or like create uh, or have a dress fit specifically around like a piece of Lego or something or how to even just include say like traditional beadwork into something sci-fi next to something from the Dollarama that's like glued on. It's a way to sort of free up my uh, relationship to materiality and free up my um, uh, anxieties around what belongs where and how do these things fit together. And what I'm hoping is that once I'm done with this puppet film, I could move on a little bit and move into other kinds of formal sculptural work and, and have a little bit less of a hang up around how things can fit together or what kind of objects can um, be in relation to each other. There's probably going to be a lot more wigs moving forward. Um, I'm just going to say a couple more things uh, just to wrap up. A exhibition that actually opened yesterday at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Toronto. Um, it's a group show called GTA 2021, Greater Toronto Artists. And these are just very quick shots. They're not like the best installation shots, but I uh, 
this is kind of where I'm at right now in tandem with the puppet film. I, um, I was asked to participate and I was thinking about like, the anxiety of the artist is something that I talk about a lot, but then I was thinking, how do you like think about that self-awareness materially or have the materials um, express that similar kind of like Wendy-esque sort of um, anxious self-awareness. And I was thinking about the, the anxiety of the art object itself, like the anxiety of its desire to both hide and be revealed and how it's, it's often used as a site of interpretation. So I have these neons that originally were presented on a wall, but then when I got them back to my studio, they were in these really weird boxes and they had been squished like where their design doesn't make sense anymore. And it almost kind of felt like cartoonish in the way that like even like, like even the first Wendy looks sort of like in this box. And so there's something kind of weirdly full circle about having the neons behave similarly. And like it's morbid to say it looks like a coffin, but it definitely seems like these objects have become put like bones together in a box, like like these like scientific specimens or something. And they they animate, like they go back and forth, like they're still animating the way they would on the wall, but like the constraints of the boxes make it a little less easier to understand what they are. So I kind of enjoy the idea of that abstraction based on this like constraint. Um, and here there's like a, you know, a reference to the history of like walking cycles or animation, uh, trying to like, it's either melting or it's like coming into form from a blob, but also in relation to like the heaviness of, of like this thing where artworks are always just in a box or trying to get out of a box or going back into a box. Um, this one I'm still sort of thinking about like what all the associations are. But uh, originally it was supposed to be three boxes stacked and then like the legs sort of like either stuck or trying to get out. But then like one of the boxes got kicked out by accident and it just opened up. And I thought that there is sort of something funny about having the bottom of the box be completely empty, but also like everything could just fall out at any moment. Um, and the last thing I will say is um, similarly, the mocha has these pillars that like bring people a lot of anxiety. And I'll, I think a lot of people have talked about how those pillars are so difficult because when you show artwork, you always have to contend with them. And I thought like, well, if we're going to be talking about the anxiety of artwork, it might also be interesting to fold in the like anxiety of the architectural space. So I created these like jackets to zip up and hide the pillars, but in hiding them, you're also kind of revealing them. Like there's this like, there's really no way out no matter what you do. And, and so like each pillar, as you look at it, it, it seems as though the jacket is coming off. And that's an, another reference to like an animation or a walking cycle or like the phases of like hiding and revealing. Um, so yeah, that's my talk. Thanks a lot. So hi, Walter. Nice to see you. Yeah. Nice to see you too. Hi, Chloe. Um, so yeah, that was really, um, a great way to spend my three o'clock on a Wednesday. Um, I had lots of questions going into it for you, but they were all just so beautifully put in your presentation, but it's a good thing I thought of way more questions. Okay, good. I'm glad. I'm glad that I said things that made sense. Oh yeah, no, bit. I think it made lots of sense. And I mean, I knew that we were um, on a similar wavelength with a lot of the things we do, but it was just mm. all like, you know, it's really cool. It all just clicks right in. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So. I think, I mean, one of my favorite things about your 
work and that I relate to mine especially is quite I think it's quite niche is like when especially it was uh, when you brought up your Kathy Kathy comics ah, it's like um creating this universe that's sort of um uh, its genesis is these like this wine mom midwestern wine mom culture uh -huh. but then just totally expanding that in either like minute or major trippy ways um so i think that's kind of special mm -hmm. <laughs> as a genesis for that yeah um yeah i think i mean I, I follow between the walls your instagram series and one thing i really appreciate about tamara and riva and that universe is that one thing that you say explicitly in an instagram comment is like there's no order just take it as it comes <laughs> and this like expanded um like timeline where like the narrative is kind of all over the place and it's more of like a feeling than an actual coherent narrative but that narrative you leave enough crumbs so that there is sort of still a story to follow like i think it's very radical thank you um it's a, yeah i would say for that storytelling style is quite liberating to um meet with my creative partners on that and just be like what do we want to film today like are they going to be having a fight or is there like a weird russian mafia space fought against them <laughs> like what is it today and then yeah you can just set it like 20 years ago into the future in another dimension it's just like well oh, whatever yeah yeah and also i like that maybe the like russian subplot could be there for a bit but then if you get bored with it you just leave it yeah. and then it could come back maybe that like it's just one of these things that it's open enough where you don't have to like resolve anything yeah um yeah and i mean and also that juxtaposing um the actual medium that we're trying to imitate or sort of satirize which is like daytime television yeah you know it's like basic glory um yeah so, yeah daytime television has a lot of like um a million plots at the same time and a lot of them are extremely outrageous and yeah, yeah. i appreciate that it's got like an east enders vibe also thank you yeah um, <laughs> yeah i mean and one of the challenges i guess with that is like you start writing these characters that just, um, well, one of them, they just have some character differences, extrovert, introvert, and then you just start piling on all of these things. And it's like, oh, well, if Riva is like running from the Russian mafia, does this other plot point make sense for her? And then it's like, well, it does now. And then you make it work. <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> yeah, because depending on whether you're extrovert or an introvert, like things can, can just happen. To anybody and then it's like well it's just an excuse to try to write how that character would respond to this thing exactly yeah um and that leads me into another sort of topic i wanted to talk about today with you which is um um when these things and stories and themes plot lines come up in your work um something that I assume and that I resonate with is that it's, well, yeah, it's a reflection of something that you're probably maybe going through um, in your own life, right? Um, so, so an interesting question that I have for you and something that I ask myself also is um, about your boundaries, um, your boundaries with that universe. Uh, for example, like how much um do you let seep into the wendy universe like do you know i would you let like was covid gonna seep in there or you're like i don't want to write about covid and how much of the wendy universe um do you want to keep there and not let into your own life like does that make sense um yeah because sometimes well, i'm like oh like with the sandy bridges i'm like no sandy doesn't know about that or deal with that like no uh-huh and it's like, ah, actually, I want to take off the wig and live my life. And so I need to leave her in the closet for a day. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one thing that I noticed um, when I first started writing Wendy is it might have just been coincidences, but I feel like 
I would write stories and then they would come true afterwards. Like the exact situation. I don't know if this ever happened to you, but did you ever write something? (laughs) And then the thing that you wrote actually happens. And then kind of scary. (laughs) And then you kind of feel like, oh, like am I like in a Twilight Zone episode or like are you afraid of the dark where like I I write things and they come true? Yeah. Um, probably not, but that has happened. But also one thing that I've been grappling with is like, how do you like be a writer and then like protect the people in your real life at the same time? Mm-hmm. Uh, because for better or for worse, a lot of people like feel like there are Wendy characters that are based on them. Absolutely. And that's not always true, yeah. but sometimes some situ- some things kind of are based on things that have happened that involve other people and it's like how do you be true to like the like truth of the like emotional reality of the book and like not hurt the feelings of people who exist in real life that is a very real struggle um um yeah i mean especially because when um it leads me to another topic question i had um, like when you are writing all these characters, like when you're writing Wendy, I mean, like I could ask, but I feel like you kind of explained it and we know the answer, like how much a part you are of Wendy, but then like in the rest of the Wendy universe, um, all of these characters, um, like when I'm writing a universe like that, all these other characters definitely are different archetypes that I think I host. But like, also, that's the only way that I feel like I can write them is because I know part of them. But also, they're all parts of relationship, like a small part of a relationship I have with one friend. And then it's one other friend who's like, hey, I wear a shirt like that. Is that about me? And it's like, well, I guess you are kind of like that in other ways. But no, it's not. So yeah, it's like. That's exactly, that is exactly the answer to that question. And I feel like people think that it's more than that, but it's not. It's really every character is just a little bit of someone else or something, but also me, like you're, because they're fictional, you're creating them out of the soup of reality. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we are creating out of the soup of reality. And then um, just bending that reality just a little bit or a lot for whatever feels good and right and it's like if you are twisting that character a lot for an enjoyable experience uh from the artist and the viewer's point of view well sometimes it might be exaggerating a little bit and that sometimes requires a conversation with someone else um well i I always think of this Zadie Smith quote where she said, uh, fiction is not a reflection of reality. It's a space to put all of the hypotheticals and fantasies and um, um, I, like, like, yeah, the fantasies that reality gives you. Yeah. It's a space of hypotheticals. So it's never, ever exactly reality. No, it can't be. <laughs> no, it absolutely can't be. It never would be, even if it tried. So, well, yeah, it's hard to... We can start oh. talking about what reality is, too, but I don't think we're here for that. Yeah, no, exactly. What is reality? Maybe yeah. where the novel and then Wendy's world is the real world, or well, Tamara and Reba are real. I wouldn't argue with that, you know? I mean, I don't know which... Um, okay, so that actually leads me into another sort of thing. Um, how do you feel about, um, I was able to break this sort of thought process down for myself in the last couple of years, and it was so helpful. And I think you talked a bit about this too. Um, so how do you, um, do you compartmentalize yourself to create your work? For example, like when I'm writing a Sandy Bridges thing, I will be like, wait, who am I? Like Sandy wouldn't write this. And I'm like, no, like, Richard is the writer, Sandy is performing it. Okay, Barbara is the agent. Yeah. Uh, um, there's, and then, okay, so, and then like, um, I'm writing grants, right? It's like, there's so many people inside of me that I have to compartmentalize into doing these roles. Mm-hmm. And then 
like consequently they show those roles show up in the writing later you know um yeah so well it really sounds to me that you're channeling like i guess this is what's interesting about your practice is that it's so tied up in performance it is like you are a performance artist as well that like of course like the writing uh process is also performative in that way I don't know if it's exactly the same for me. I think in a more like physicality sense, my version of that is if I need to draw like a facial expression, like I contort my body and I like make the facial expression. And like, for me, like it's more about visually, like how do I convey an emotion? And I often have to perform it using my hand or my mouth or like. That's very cool. Yeah. But like in terms of like personas, like I don't really feel like I, I'm not really writing as anybody. Yeah. Yeah, no, I don't know. I don't think so. I mean, like, a lot of the Wendy characters, there's different versions of me. So maybe yeah. I'm tapping into a particular version of myself or a particular anxiety that I have. Yeah, I guess that's what I'm, yeah. Um, yeah. And then, like, not, not letting them bleed in to another one that you want to keep. Like, no, that's not Wendy. Like, put her over there. Um, OK. Um, yeah, I think it was what was cool when we were talking about languages, but I feel like you weren't talking about literal languages. Um, and I think it's really neat that you can create a new language simply by having the crossover. So like, um, you have your sculpture and you have Wendy, and then having that little meta crossover which also I think it's beautiful that you weren't like, oh, how can I do meta today? It's like, you can't really escape it. You're just yeah. Like, um, so yeah, I think it's exciting that there's a whole new language and expression created just by having the overlap. Yeah, and I think uh, for me, what it comes down to is not so much about trying to create a new language, but think about what the core concepts are that I see coming up in my different elements of work and they do have to be about like uh, reality versus fiction and like incongruent sorts of things hitting up against each other and these continuing themes of like both hiding and revealing and like the role of an artist and like public versus private like that kind of stuff is just comes up no matter what I'm making so to be able to like channel those deep core themes is a way for me to mix and match like different forms of like formal language um, while still feeling true to like something specific. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, that's very cool. Um, okay. So another thing I had here. Oh yeah. So though, um, I liked when you were talking about your merch and, um, how that is like, I like having this idea that um, you have merch, which is like sort of also part of the universe. And it's like, um, yeah, these are tote bags for sale because it's like, but it also is part of the storytelling. Do you yeah. Like that too? Uh, sorry, I'm looking for your Sandy Bridges uh, mask. I have one of your masks. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's fun to like tie the merch right into the story you're telling. I can't find it. Oh, well. Um, yeah. Uh, I think maybe like an example of that. It's not quite merch, but when I, I showed very briefly that sign in Japan, the Wendy for sale okay. sign. Okay, what like, does it say? It says Wendy for sale. And it's kind of just like exemplary other object somehow. Like it's a bit commercial. It's a bit... Uh, like about capitalism. Yeah. It's kind of merch. It's an object, basically. Yeah. And yeah. objects and merch, like they have a way of like revealing like an extra layer to like a story. Yeah. Like in that case, the the artist residency that I went to in Japan was like actually kind of like gentrify. -y. Like they kicked out all the sex workers and turned them into art studios. So like having a sign that says a Wendy for sale, like rings very weird in that. Um, but I think like if I'm thinking about like your merch, like precious puppies and how 
it goes from a video series starring like your queer friends into a fashion line. There's something about like community that's embedded in that that adds to the like the the art practices concept that like the same people that are potentially in these videos are also the people that are probably buying the shirts and that like you're creating almost like a club of some kind (laughs) yeah um yeah um it does definitely uh it has created that vibe i see where you're going um it's uh what's interesting um with the beginning of that project is it actually started out as just like stickers and like painting fabric to make bags and stuff mm-hmm. and not and not until a bit later into it did I make the animated series and give them actual personalities and scripts and yeah like and so having that first let it inform me like when I was writing it like um I'm writing a story about these characters who are sort of maybe like already celebrated and famous in this universe but do they know it (laughs) it's like um like they are uh, they're like characters on tv in this other universe Um, oh like are they all actors or something kind of it's like i mean season two is going to be a very much meta dive into that because ribbons who was missing now (laughs) jumped out of the tv and has the uh, the spell is now he's going to write the next season of this guaranteed bestseller because he's uh-huh. going to deal with the TV demon. Um, yeah. How conscious is Wendy? Because um, it's, it's like Wendy sneaks out of your sculptures, but like, does she know she's in a cartoon? Does she question that she might be in a comic simulation? No, no, I don't think I'm going to go there. Yeah, okay. That's another, yeah, about boundaries and stuff where you're pushing something. Right, but... yeah. Uh, no, I, don't, I think she'll always just be her own person. Yeah. Um, I mean, there are different versions of Wendy. Like, Mandy is just man Wendy. Like, instead of Wendy, oh, okay. it's the man version of Wendy. So that's why it's Mandy. And then Zendy is the space version of Wendy. That's why there's an X. So she has alter egos in different universes. Like, I wonder... All... Zendi would ever have the opportunity and space to like peer into other dimensions and be like, there's Wendy, what? There's Mandy? Oh my god, do we are we living parallel lives? <laughs> I thought it actually would be funny if there was a comic series in the Zendi universe called Wanda. <laughs> <laughs> I think. But it's like Wendy with like black hair, like <gasps> <laughs> Or like Wilma. Actually, in the Wendy universe, there's a comic series called Wilma. Yeah, yeah. Um, it just goes on and on and on. Um, I thought I could find it. I don't have any of my stuff anywhere, but yeah. But yeah, um, one thing I wanted to tell you is um, I get a lot of inspiration from the way that you similarly are like, okay, these stickers are now a cartoon series, and then now this cartoon series is now like a short series, and like there's no like there's no distinction between different forms of making and dissemination for you and i think there's a certain kind of freedom and not allowing not letting yourself be constrained to like one particular part of the art canon like i think it's really um impressive and valuable when when you witness an artist that's just like i just want to make exactly what i want to make thank you so this is why i always tell people you're like one of my favorite artists (laughs) thank you walter um yeah, I mean, to jump off of that a little bit, um, I thought like this conversation um, was when you said, uh, when you're talking about all one line, and I think it was like the string that you could pick up and see that the comic just falls flat, it's all one line. And I was like, whoa, because um, essentially all of these different facets of the same universe, or even like, like the precious puppies between the walls, Sandy Bridges, like universes, um, like not because I want them all to go together, but just when I'm thinking about myself as an artist, I'm like, oh, well, they're all on this new TV network. And then yeah. like, there's one archetype personality inside me that runs the whole network, you know? Um, yeah, yeah. And do you have a name for that person yet runs a network or is it just you? 
Um, well, a lot of these characters, I mean, I was just spitting out names before Richard and Diana or whatever, but I mean, they have, I know yeah. who they are and what they feel yeah, like, yeah. right? And I, it has been so helpful to compartmentalize those people inside me. Don't lock me up or anything. Um, it's a little bit like Who Framed Roger Rabbit, too. Like the cartoons and the actors are all working for the same studio. It is. A, the cartoons yeah. are treated kind of like just another working actor in Hollywood. Well, that's exactly, and that's kind of how I was doing. I don't know if you remember my the Scrims TV. Yeah, yeah, I like, I like, yeah, I've been following since day one. <laughs> that was exper. I mean, I was kind of thinking about, it, but yeah, no, they're all like reality TV characters that don't actually know they're being played in the film. Um, and then, like one of the characters from reality TV show, um, she's getting sued for tax fraud, so she has to run away. But then she buys the network and comes back, and then she buys Disney. <laughs> like, um, yeah. um, so I'll have to say I thought it was oh yeah but when you brought up the one line the one piece of yarn that writes every one of those stories it's like that is the internal thing the subconscious deepest voice mm. that is like the reason for whatever you create and it's like that yeah. is yeah like for you, you're saying that like the, the, the line is like, it's this formless line that's still there, but it doesn't have quite a single yeah. shape. It does not, yeah, exactly. But it yeah. does have a single voice that like, yeah. um, that um, expresses all the different facets, even if it's very different, whether it's like a painting or a song, like yeah. it's like that your artist, as an artist or the person, or if you think there's a big, a larger collective sort of thing going on, it's like that voice. Yeah. Yeah, and I've also read the, um, I mean, I read that like style or your style is like your idea and then like the, there's your idea and then there's what you, how you execute it or like what you want to make and what you make, like all of the faults on the way there, all of the ways that you're not the best, that's yeah. what your style is. And that's kind of like the most, the stuff I want to celebrate the most. Yeah. Like, and it's the stuff that's the coolest. I mean, that's how the guy made the microwave. And I, oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, it was a mistake or something. Yeah. Made the hot air balloon. I don't know. And I also think that, you know, like, the closer you get to understanding what you're doing, you only ever get there by half every time. And there's always going to be a gap in between what you've made and what you think you meant and what you did. And like, I think that like, that's the gap that we all get to fill as like viewers with like our own interpretations. So I think it's totally okay to yeah. have a line that doesn't always have a form or make a form. Yeah. I think that's very wise. And I, resonate with that um yeah it reminds me of being frustrated like in my university art classes when i felt like i was getting docked marks for um having a product that was different than my um my original design and i understand yeah. like they want your original design they want you to stay true to the idea and it's like, okay but like this is not much better than what it would have been if I'd done that. Like, why didn't you guys make me work this way? <sighs> <sighs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I guess it makes sense sometimes, but... Um, okay, one more question I have for you about all this. Um, do you have... Um, do you have an escape for when you have a... When you're creating, or do you even want one? When you have... Um, when you're creating something and you end up with a product, is there like a medium that is an escape or thing it's like, oh my God, I can't do Wendy right now. And then you like do some. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I run away from all of my mediums into other ones. They're all an escape from one to the other. They're just these different, it's like a house. <laughs> and then you just walk into different rooms depending on where you feel like you need to be. Um, yeah. Do you think they all tie in in the end? Yeah, they're all in the same house, for yeah, sure. Yeah, they are. They're all in the same yeah. house. Yeah. Is that how you feel? 
yeah, I definitely feel like uh, there's an escape from one medium to the next. And um, I've stopped listening to the voices externally that are like, yeah, why can't you just do one thing? Um, yeah, who says that? I'm like, <laughs> I don't know, some people do. Um, and I'm like, I guess I see how that maybe makes sense to you, but like, that's not really feeding my also like to stretch the analogy sometimes you bring something from one room into another room and yeah. it makes the second room nicer like you bring a house plant from one room yeah. into the other it creates a new language it creates yeah. a whole new vibe um, yeah you need to be able to like you know when chloe before we were uh doing this officially she was saying that she's taking budo classes and i thought that was interesting because she has a printmaking background and like it's all coming together yeah um, yeah, I mean, so, yeah, I'm like, I guess my question with that is like, can you, or do you want to escape? Um, like, I feel like Precious Puppies was originally an escape from performance and stuff. So I was like, I just want to draw and like not have people energy at me. But yeah. then like, um, yeah, everything just starts informing the other eventually. Yo, yeah, well, that's what Wendy was for me too. I just didn't want to keep trying to fit into the art world the way it, you know it wasn't working out. So, and people were like shocked that I decided to make Wendy comics. Like I had a friend be like, "Well, it's not conceptual, but blah blah blah." And I was like, "Well, I'm gonna prove you wrong." And then like, it has proved to be at least a little bit conceptual. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, kind of love it. Yeah. I um. I. I wonder if we have any questions from anybody. If we don't, then I guess we could. Yeah. Maybe maybe I'll ask you both a question. Um, th this idea that that you're supposed to, you know, marry things together in in a seamless fashion. You know, for each of you, wh where is this coming from, and is it productive or not? You mean like the uh, internal, external pressure to do that? Yeah, like this idea that as an artist, the different facets of your creative expression should all kind of meet together in this like perfectly coherent, mm -hmm. planned out thing. When, I mean, you know, for me, I think the most interesting practices that I see in colleagues and artists I admire, it's often people just frantically trying out ideas mm -hmm. but it seems like there's this you know pressure externally internally that everything always has to be pre-planned to to the last inch and I know Walter you, you kind of mentioned that in grad school that you got this th these comments about how like you know wh where were the comics and the sculptures meeting or not meeting and and Lenore, I, I also noticed that you said that in art school you were having comments about how like the, the, the proposal and the end result was different, which I mean to me is the, the whole process of creation in the first place. So I guess I yeah, I mean it's kind of a, a big question, but I'm just wondering like the these kind of pressures, are they are they productive for either of you? Are they something that's interesting to 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 confront or is it just a distraction um well i guess my yeah my first thought is like it either comes from a place of like well-meaning some what somebody well-meaning wants to give you advice to make your life easier as an artist or it comes from alternatively maybe like uh this like audience point of view frustration about like well uh i can't connect those two dots myself can you help me connect them so i can like so you, i can breathe you in better <laughs> yeah i think it's important to allow the audience to connect the dots themselves if that's what they're curious to do i think that um that question about like why things don't relate on a certain level it was kind it has been helpful to encounter that question because I haven't, I've had to ask myself that, but not like, why can't you combine them or why can't they make more sense together? But like, what are the like underlying themes that I'm interested in as a person in the world? And how did those things 
like pop up in my different art practice elements and like how, what what are those things that are in common that aren't obvious and oftentimes like i said like it is about alienation or it is about like personhood or something right it's always just some like primordial theme and so as long as i feel like no matter what i do like everything i make is going to just be kind of about like the same kinds of things or like there will be some thematic element it doesn't it, there's not a pressure i feel to ever have to make any of the actual things make sense together per se i'm gonna let like when i'm like 95 years old and dead like i'm just gonna let some <laughs> art critic like make all of the dots for me like i don't think it's an artist's responsibility to explain every single thing No, I, I definitely agree with you there. And I mean, to me, as, as my own practice shifts over the years, I, I often get people be asking me, like, why is what you're doing now so different what you from what you were doing then? And I'm like, it's to me, it's such a clear, straight line that like yeah. everything that I've ever done has like built up to be what I'm doing now. And like, if you can't see that, I don't really know what to, to tell you, like, if, I, I guess if you can't see it, I can't explain it to you because to me, all of the language was already set from like the first kind of gestures. And I mean, you know, knowing you, Walter, and, and being colleagues, like I saw your first sculpture shows in galleries. And I, I do think that there's something that relates them to the comics. There, There's there's just this sense of embodiment with the material that that makes them be very much characters even the more abstract pieces like they're they're so obviously mm -hmm. like comedic almost like tra tragic figures mm -hmm. that it, it, it it's like you know obviously over the years and with your new work you've been redrawing these boundaries between the like figuration and the use of narrative and and kind of swapping uh photos of stuff into into new works etc but th this kind of like tragic comic figure that's like very material very complex like very compelling like as like an object to to engage with haptically had to me it's always been there from like you know seeing your early work and doing zines and posters and and the early sculptures like that that line was already there so it, it's really interesting to me to hear that like even as you got more narrative that that there was people who were not seeing that that parallel Uh, yeah, maybe I should take uh, get a professional development grant and take those clown <laughs> classes that you were Dude. That, you, that you were taking. They sound interesting. The, the the clown class I'm taking is like something about like Sad Clown 101. Yeah, it's like the the tragedy of the clown. I'm like, <laughs> hell yeah, that's what I need. <laughs> well, um, since we don't seem to have any questions from the audience, I think uh, we might wrap things up here. We've been talking okay. for an hour and 15 yeah. minutes i'll give people one last shot if they if they have anything they want to ask and otherwise i i would like to thank the both of you for participating in the first of many of these zoom artist talks and readings that we're hosting at volume this year um anyone in the audience who's interested you can check it all out on our website and socials. We have Ken Lum giving a talk tonight. Um, tomorrow night, we have Moira Davy in conversation with Marise Larivière. And Friday, we have Harry Dodge speak, reading from his new book. And then that's going to be followed with a conversation by with Sky Gooden. And that is on top of all the other on like real life events that we have going on here in Montreal. And the program of Zoom events we'll have throughout October. So I would like to thank everybody for checking out this first talk. And again, thank you, Walter and Lenore. It's been so generous of you guys to share 
your practices and your interest in these kind of meta character universes as someone who really you know is is really interested in narrative and putting the personal and in, into my art it's 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 just such a pleasure to hear colleagues talk about these kind of issues with such lucidity and so much gusto so thank you both and thanks for every, everyone who joined us yeah thanks everybody thanks so much chloe it's my pleasure i'm so glad that i got to have you thanks all right well that is it we are signing out thanks again and um hopefully people will join some of the other events and if you're in montreal check out the fair this weekend all right bye bye, bye.